Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher. This is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with Jen Lim. She is the author of the book Beyond Happiness, How Authentic Leaders Prioritize Purpose and People for Growth and Impact. And in this conversation, obviously, we're going to talk about the contents of her book, but we'll go beyond that, and we're going to define happiness. How can you be happy if you don't define happiness correctly? We're going to analyze how other people mistakenly define happiness. We'll talk a little bit about the journey between her last book and this one. And we're going to talk about not just surviving, but thriving in the current climate. So if any of that or all of that is interesting to you, you're in for a great conversation with Jen Lim. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show, Jen Lim. Jen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for having me. So I'm bittersweet excited to have you on the show because I'm familiar a little bit with Beyond Happiness and and some of the backstory prior to this book and the Zappos company and everything. So I'm excited to talk to you. But of course, again, somewhat recent history with Tony Shea's passing is still kind of fresh in people's minds. I'm curious, though. The book, obviously, it's called Beyond Happiness, How Authentic Leaders Prioritize Purpose and People for Growth and Impact. There's a lot in that title. That is a packed title. I'm curious what the path has looked like for you to walk to this book. In other words, why this book and why now? Mm, yeah, what a path has been. And I appreciate you bringing up Tony. It's actually very timely because I was just in Vegas, just got back from this weekend of uh, celebrating his birthday. Mm. Yeah, it was the first time a lot of people got together in person since his passing. So anyway, it was kind of a beautiful moment to see all the amazing connections he had created and you know all the changes he made. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up. And in terms of the path of the book is like, well, Delivering Happiness, uh, just for context, was a book that Tony and I launched back in 2010. And since then, well, we didn't realize there was going to be more to it, but there was a demand for happiness and it became sort of this, well, we created a company around it. And since then, you know, the last 11 years, I've been in a super lucky position to be able to carry on these scientific principles of happiness in the workplace through delivering happiness. And it was awesome to see that companies around the world, you know, not just Zappos, it's like all companies can do this and fundamentally create happier workplaces because their employees are happier and they're for their customers and they're actually more profitable and sustainable in the end. And it became an international thing. It still is. So I sat down for this book, you know, beginning of 2020, and it was all, you know, the outline was all ready to go. It was basically sharing the stories, stats and stories of all that's happened in the last 11 years to show all these different organizations, industry, geography, whatever it is being able to implement it. So I thought it'd be a source of inspiration and the feeling of, oh, yes, I can do this too. But then, of course, you know, Everyone got 2020. Yeah. <laughs> and that outline was like, oh, I don't think I, this is not, you know, this is not enough, you know, with first of, uh, sign of COVID and then global recession and then social unrest. And then ultimately, as you mentioned, you know, Tony's passing in November. And every time a new headline came out, I was just like, this book <laughs> is, it's bigger than me. It's bigger than anything that I've done. And so that's why I didn't even come up with the title to the very end. Because what I wanted to put into context was that, yeah, happiness is important and, of course, scientific and meaningful, purposeful happiness. But what I think was missing in the original outline was like this bigger sense of humanity, what humanity means in the world, but also specifically to the workplace. So that's where I started expanding on these notions. And the title Beyond Happiness, it's not just only the workplaces that I'm talking about, but it's also within ourselves. And one of the chapters that I focused on in the very beginning is start with the me. And one of the things I wanted to explore was that oftentimes people think happiness is about the highs, but it's also about the lows. And it's also about our shadow sides. It's about the weaknesses that sometimes are not at the forefront of our attention or, you know, mental well-being. So that's where Beyond Happiness kind of took the baton of wanting to say, hey, this is a new time and we're never going to go back to BC, uh, 2020 BC before COVID. So what are we going to do about now? So I really wanted to expand the conversation on what happiness means today. 
You mentioned the highs and the lows, both being components of happiness. And and that makes me have the question, and as well as the listeners have a question, and, and probably a varying definition even of happiness. There's a lot of varying definitions of what happiness is. In order to incorporate the highs and the lows into what is often just considered a positive, happy-go-lucky outlook of, quote, happiness all the time, what's your definition of happiness or what is the better definition of happiness than just, you know, Pollyanna, Mm -hmm. in other words? Right, right, right. Yeah. So for me, I always want to go back to the science of it all. So the research that's been done in scientific happiness, positive psychology, because it's so subjective in the end, as we all know, like you ask one person to the next, their definition of happiness will vary. And that's okay. But going back to the science of it, number one, and this might be the Pollyanna kind of thing you're talking about, is your sense of pleasures. You know, like, what's my happy hour drink tonight? Uh, What Netflix show am I binging on? You know, those things are pleasurable, but kind of fleeting in how happy it maintains us. And then the more sustainable form of happiness is higher purpose. So essentially doing something that's bigger than yourself, being a part of something bigger than yourself. Same thing for companies, doing something more than just making money. And that's where we saw a lot of like alignment happen between what happiness means, pleasure, purpose, And then the third thing that I talk about in my book is what I really want to hone in on. And that's the authenticity piece. It's having a sense of inherent disposition, as they call it. But basically, it's like being who you are and being true to that core. So that's why I really wanted to invite the next conversation of not just the highs, because if we actually go through our lives and think about it, as if you're like the star of your show, like you're the protagonist of your movie. Like what were your highs and lows in the past? And if you actually take some time to map that out, you can start seeing trends. And by understanding your lows as much as your highs, it actually, you can see and understand how to create a more sustainable, happy life. And what I mean by that is like, when you look at those highs and lows, what people were there or not there, what values were you living or not living? And those are the fundamental questions of how you can start defining for yourself what a more holistic, not just the highs, but the lows type of happiness can mean. It sounds to me like you're advocating for, to whatever extent we can make sure we do this, having some sort of starting point of self-awareness, but then not stopping there, but digging deeper, really knowing not only who we are, but who we're meant to be, and then taking intentional action steps towards one, being more that person we're supposed to be or we're you know, designed to be, but then beyond that, making sure that those actions, those everyday actions that we've got on our calendar or we take pleasure in align with that. That's exactly right. It totally is about that because I think, you know, we get programmed in a different way. Like, you know, we're born the way we were from our genes, but then we have our environment and that starts impacting us from a very early age and in some ways keeps on impacting us. And sometimes we're mindful of it. Sometimes we're aware of it, but sometimes we're not. But that's why I think it's such an opportune time. I know everyone experienced some form of loss, some form of grief throughout this time. And we've seen so much of it come out in forms of you know, the great resignation. And what I also believe that is the great awakening of people actually saying, wait, why am I doing this again? <laughs> why am I waking up in the morning and spending my time this way? Am I doing it aligned with who I am, number one, with the people I love and care about? And do I feel like I'm making an impact in a different way? So I think it's just a yeah really choice time to understand. And it's such a, a more common vernacular too. I mean, like Simone Biles, she just happened to have a workplace on a, a global stage. And she said, no, I, I'm not going to do that. And I think that was really eye-opening for everyone to say, it's okay to say no. Mm, yeah. And again, I think that's kind of the irony, if that's even the right applicable if it's irony, it is uh, like the <laughs> Alanis Morissette song or it's not. But uh, it, I, I, a lot of people right now have been and are in still probably a very fluctuating state of life. And that's why this book comes along at a very opportune time, because people are out there asking your title says beyond happiness. And they're like, I don't even know if I can reach happiness, let alone beyond <laughs> happiness. Right. They're questioning whether happiness is even possible right now or redefining what their definition is. And did I really know what it was or was I previously assigning meaning towards happiness before versus now? I mean, obviously, in a definition of happiness that involves 
self-discovery and finding worth in the way that you're living and not just about how you're feeling alone as a factor, that that mm-hmm. encompasses the highs and the lows. We've had a lot of lows for a, a while, and that doesn't mean you can't be happy. But a lot of people are wondering, is happiness even possible right now? Mm. Yeah. And I think that's totally aligned with why I called it beyond this, because beyond happiness is kind of like for some time, there's a train of thought of uh, people that like all I'm here for is I, I'm supposed to be happy. Like that's that's what my life is for and why I wanted to kind of push that a little bit and be more curious about that and stretch the conversation out. It's like, is that really what we're here for? In what definition is it? In what senses is it? And like what you're saying, like to your points of like, is it emotional? Is it physical? Is it mental? Basically for me, it's it's everything. It's, you know, it's really showing up as the person we were born to be. And part of our journey, I think, whether it's our day to days or identifying our purpose and values is to get back to that core. And, you know, if you want to be Oprah for a sec, like be your best self, how, how does that happen? And that's why I really just fell in love with this space. And what I really wanted to convey is that these things can sound very daunting, But it can be really practical at the end of the day if you have that sense of discovery and curiosity to ground yourself in yourself. And then those choices are still difficult sometimes, but that much more easier to make. I think that a lot of people listening in have this question of I've been in a sense of survival mode or a variation of it for a while now. And I want to move towards what you're defining happiness as. What would you say to them in terms of applying beyond happiness to everyday life right now? In other words, what's that first step or first few steps look like? Yeah. So I, I'm totally with you because in that sense of that question, it's like, how can you even talk about happiness at the time? And, you know, especially from the time COVID hit, no one wanted to touch that word, you know, with a 10 foot pole. It's just like, mm, that is just not even real. And so what is also part of this is that understanding part of the spectrum of being happy is also being resilient and having that sense of groundedness so that even though things are still relatively chaotic in the world and in our personal lives or at work, having that sense of groundedness can really help separate what stresses us out versus what we can control. So one of the things is I talk about an adaptive age and I believe this is where we're living right now. And one of the questions that we ask ourselves or we can ask ourselves, if there's something that, you know, very unexpected, devastating that happens in our lives, still unstable, you know, my biggest one, of course, was Tony's passing. It's so important to collect ourselves and ground ourselves in, wait, is this something I can control or is this something I can't? And therefore recognize the difference and then adapt accordingly. But to your question about what's the first next step, I really wanted to make my book practical. And so there's already exercises embedded in it. And in that chapter that I talked about, start with a me. The two big exercises is basically revisiting your purpose and revisiting your values. And I say revisit because you might already have them, but again, like this is a prime time to be able to do that in a new context of the world and also within yourself. So what does that look like in terms of re-evaluating? Obviously it's in the book, but I'm, I'm curious, like if somebody say, you know what, I need to do that. I need to sit down and do that. And how often do we need to do that? Yeah, I think there's varying answers that could come here. I would say, you know, you almost need to ask yourself these questions daily. At a minimum, a a weekly or monthly cadence would be preferable. But, you know, even if you can remind yourself and get a fresh perspective, even at a micro level daily, that kind of insulates you to antagonistic viewpoints towards, you know, your happiness, in other words. Yeah, I I totally agree that it needs to be revisited and also, you know, daily, monthly, quarterly, whatever's comfortable for you. But one thing to think about, too, is just to not overthink it when establishing these things. So if I break it down into like more practical steps of purpose and values. So for the purpose exercise, even if you are have a purpose statement, what we're trying to present is three questions. So number one, what energizes you? And so it doesn't have to mean positive energy. It can also mean negative energy too. Like what pisses the hell out of you in the Mm. world or in your community or whatever you're dealing with. So that's one question. The other one is talent. And this is pretty straightforward, but what I think has been really useful is just asking yourself, what do people that I respect ask me to do 
without me trying to volunteer it because they already see that within me, that is something natural for me. So that's talent. And then the third one is impact. If you ask yourself what kind of impact you want to make, and you don't have to, you know, it's not on the scale of I want to change the world. I mean, it's on the scale of what's most important to you that you want to impact. So if you answer those three questions, that in itself is your own draft purpose statement. And really an important part of all this is to realize it's a draft. A purpose constantly evolves. And so in terms of the reminders or daily or weekly reminders, just put your purpose statement on the wall and see how it sticks or doesn't stick and keep on evolving it as you go through your day to days and making your decisions based on whether or not you're aligned with that purpose statement. It just becomes like a a draft North Star of how to make your decisions on a daily basis. So that's the purpose side. But there's a values exercise too. I don't know if you want to yeah. dive into that. Well, let's let's do that in a second. I can see how, and I love that you included when with Energize things that you're maybe against. It, it's more like you know, it's not the right word. I don't. I'm going to use the word, but I hate this word. It, it trigger. I hate that word just because it's like, well, everything triggers everybody about everything. It's like, okay, great. It became ubiquitous. In other words, it did. Yeah, I hate it. But uh, in other words, I would choose to say. What is something that activates you? Mm. I like energize. I'm just trying to think of another way to put it. In other words, what makes you spring into action, whether it's a positive that you want to be involved or if it's a negative thing that still makes you spring into action to keep it from happening or stop something or save somebody or you know what I mean? So I love that. And then talent is something that I mean, we could spend a whole episode on talent. How do you discover what it is that you're good at? I love that you spun it that what is it people are asking you to do because they see you being good at it, even if you're too blind to see it just yet? Yeah, especially people that you respect. Yeah. And then impact is definitely, you know, what kind of mark do you want to leave? And I love the idea of thinking of this even in smaller ways. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I want to make sure that my son knows that I love him, you know, and how do I do that? Well, it's it's little, it's, it's in moments. It's in small mm-hmm. moments, consistent. So that's why I kind of lean on that daily. I, I don't think these would change necessarily that frequently. It changed maybe more quarterly to annually in terms of major changes on this. And that's an assumption I'm making, actually. I think that if I were actually able to spend some time kind of looking at these daily and weekly in terms of this draft purpose statement, I might find that the overall form of what these are wouldn't change, but the way that I live them out would become more defined and more nuanced. Mm-hmm. Totally, totally. If you don't mind, I, I mean, I'm totally aligned with what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, so in point. And uh, if you don't mind me sharing a story about that, it's oh, actually... Oh, totally, totally. Go ahead. It's, actually, <laughs> um, it's my bro- own brother. And I can talk freely because I already put it in the book and he was okay with it. Good, <laughs> because good. I <laughs> called him out, but he knew it. So basically, like he's super purpose-driven, very values aligned. And what he realized, so basically... Family was one of his top values and his purpose in life. And then he would come home from work. This is before COVID. And he would come home from work and his daughter would call him daddy work, daddy work. And he'd be confused. Like, why are you calling me daddy work? And so basically his wife said, my sister-in-law said, well, every time she asks where you are, I said work. So she's equating you with work because you're not around. That's, you know, implied. But um, it really struck him because he was so intentional in wanting to, you know, build and grow his family. And at the same time, he wasn't living his values. There's something that we call the compass in the clock. Like, what's your compass? Like, what's truly your purpose and values? But how are you spending your time? And it becomes clearer after you do the initial purpose and values exercise that, as you're saying, you know, like you can see your literal calendar and see whether or not it's aligned with those things and how how those things can be tweaked so that the compass and clock are more aligned on a day-to-day basis. Mm. I love that. I'm glad you shared that. Okay. So what's the other exercise? Yeah. So the, the values exercise, there's several of them, but the one I wanted to highlight in the book is called the happiness heartbeats. And we kind of already touched upon this earlier in this podcast, but basically if you take your own personal life I actually encourage not just work life, but you're just your general life. And if you go through it and like I kind of alluded to earlier, like you're the star of your own show and you go through your highs and lows. It's kind of like the hero's journey thing, you know, like you go through map out three highs, three lows. And 
start asking questions around that of why are these meaningful moments or why are these still stuck in me? Why is it still resonating with me in good or bad ways? And in the book, I have a full list of like sample values that you can attribute it to. So that's been our most effective way for our clients to actually start identifying their values. And it's so interesting that they're really surprised sometimes, like because it's from a personal lens, not from, you know, personal introspection lens versus just what they think their values are. And to see that that sometimes they're not aligned. Most of the times they're not actually. So that's one of the other exercises I would recommend. It's like taking that personal inventory and pulling out those trends, pulling out those values. And then that can help again with those day to day, week to week, month to month decisions that we're making all the time. Yeah, it sounds like a character slash action plan alignment. You know, it kind of goes back to what you're for and what you're against, but it's who you want to be. Who do you want to be in all these different instances? What are the things that you believe and hold to be true? And then do your actions align with who you say that is? And if not, how do you course correct? Mm -hmm, Totally. And just to build on that, like based on what you experienced, you know, in your own way. I think that's a big differentiator of just being able to say, that's interesting how that's still with me. You know, even though that happened when I was five years old or 10 years old or whatever, knowing that it's still embedded within us. Yeah, I can talk about, I know you don't like the word trigger, but (laughs) it's everywhere. Go for it. (laughs) No, I mean, no, it's just, it made me think of the, I don't know if you like the word trauma either, but that's all right. That's all right. (laughs) It's okay. All right. (laughs) That's the Eric test. But to be real about it is that we've all as individuals experienced some form of trauma and it's all very relative, like it's very, very subjective to our own lives. But if we decide to do the work and actually understand it, if not embrace it, ideally, there are so many people that aren't doing that. You know, they're just kind of sweeping things under the rug because it's too painful or too, too everything. And one of the things that helped me through Tony's passing was a quote that was inspired by Rumi. And what he said was, the cure for pain is in the pain. And that carried with me throughout the writing, the understanding of it, because even though I've been in the happiness space for like way, way long now, I didn't really actually understand what it meant. You know, it's cliche to say you don't know your highs until you know your lows. It's different when you have to actually experience it and actually be sitting still with it and being at peace with where the pain's coming from and whether it's coming from an external source or something that happened to us, you know, as individuals as we go through life. But yeah, I think uh, that's been a a very big learning in terms of like using these kind of tools to navigate and ground ourselves, knowing there's things that we cannot control. Now, obviously, you've done a lot of the work with this inside of organizations, and I love that it scales down to the individual and our own non-work lives, although we're human beings that have, work. you know, there's work-life balance and all these different terms, but it's like, we're not just our work, but we're not just our non-work time. It's kind of an incorporation of both. I'm curious, how have you seen this play out in terms of going beyond happiness inside of organizations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, a big part of the next chapters of the book, because I went from the me to the we and the we for me are teams and obviously the organization that the teams make up. So what I've seen over the years, and we've worked with clients like Starbucks to Sally Mae to the government of Dubai. I mean, it's been such an interesting read on global society and what it means to go beyond happiness, especially today. And so one of the the metaphors I use in the book is about greenhouses. And actually, Tony was really big on being a greenhouse builder. He felt as a leader, we're here to grow greenhouses and not be the tallest tree or be the biggest plant, which I totally believe in. But what I added to that is that As we grow greenhouses as leaders, we also need to make sure we're nurturing our own first. It's the whole oxygen mask, you know, in the plane. Yes. Maybe because we don't fly that much, we don't hear it as much, so we forget. But all the same, that's sort of the nucleus of how we build this in, in organizations. So what happens then is like, even if you're not the CEO, like let's just say you're part of a team or maybe you lead the team. The point in this whole thing is that organizational change, therefore your own happiness because of it, happens from that person. Everyone can be that leader because if they show, and I talk about it in greenhouse metaphor of all these conditions of what we need to do as organizations, which are, there's four of them. There's alignment, there's belonging, there's accountability, like a village there for each other. And then there's commitment. 
to these ideas. And what I found time and time again, when you have these conditions in a greenhouse, it doesn't matter again if you're not the CEO. If you're a team member or you're the team leader and you put these things into place, then you just see really magical things happen. What if, since most of us listening, if we're part of an organization, we're lower percentage wise on average than say management level, how would we encourage or even catalyze change towards implementing this in the organization that we're part of? Yeah, I love that question because it's like basically applies to so many of us <laughs> when we don't have a, someone that walks the talk. And so where I've seen the most effective way to go about it is that if you actually choose to take on the work yourself for yourself, number one, like we all want to live fulfilling lives. So do the work on being authentic and being who you are. And then when you actually start introducing these things to your teammates, let's just say, you know, because we all work within teams, maybe several teams and be able to show that to leadership that, hey, since we started doing these things, our team has been working so much better, collaborating more, producing things quicker, more effective, you know, whatever metric that is important to your leadership, start measuring it. And there's no good leader out there that would say, what? You're happier, you're more fulfilled, and you're being more productive and making more money for the company. You know, there's no good leader that would say, stop that. (laughs) So, and if they do, you're not, you know, obviously at the right place. But I know it's easier said than done sometimes, but the question then becomes, is it worth it? Is it worth living your life authentically, true to yourself, and as fulfilling as it can be? And oftentimes it, the answer is yes, <laughs> but the, the question is whether or not you want to be able to do the work, rally people that you can think could carve out a project, carve out metrics for success, share it with leadership. And it's not cliche that happiness actually is contagious in that way. Yeah, I think I used the word catalyze. You know, one person can really be a catalyst for this kind of just spreading throughout an organization. Totally. And it can be anyone. Like, I'll give you an example. Northwell Health Systems up in New York, they just did an amazing job, especially during COVID. I mean, this is a hospital system. And, you know, just imagine their stories of what they had to deal with in the last couple of years. And they actually rose in ranks on the Great Places to Work list for Fortune from like 90 something to like 19 during this time. And so think about how adverse these conditions can be. It's almost like they're frontliners in a war. And they were able to show and help their employees get to a better understanding of their own well-being, their own mental health. There's a story about this guy and he was a janitor. He cleaned up the rooms for patients. And so one of the patients that were there, he was getting checked out and he told his son, who was actually a doctor, he told his son, I had a really good time at the hospital. And his son's just like, what are you talking about? Like, how can you have a good time at the hospital? And he's like, no, you know why? It's because Louise. Louise is a janitor and he brought me the sports section in the New York Times because he knew I loved the Mets. And it's that simple of this guy, Louise, living his own purpose of, you know, I'm going to take care of people. These patients are my patients. And that impacted this guy's life for the rest of his life. And so just to give an example of any single one person can scale this change in their own ways and being authentic themselves and their purpose. Oh, that's a great story. And it's a great example. I think we've all kind of seen those kinds of examples. And I think they're probably more prevalent than we think to acknowledge just because, you know, 24 hour news cycle and getting clicks, in other words. So I think that this is really a great place to start 2022. We've had 2020 and its sequel, 2021, and I think a lot of people (laughs) want to put those years, I mean, for better or for worse, they would like to start to be happier and be beyond happy, beyond happiness even. And Mm -hmm. so I'd love to point people to where they can find out more about the book, dive in a bit more into the story and stories of the book. So is there a best place to direct people to? Yeah, yeah. We actually launched um, because we have DeliveringHappiness.com for the company. But for the book, we launched JenLim.com with more information on the book, excerpts and all that, just to give you a better sense of what's inside. But yeah, it's JenLim.com. And I'm on social at ByLim, so B-Y JenLim. And I I always love hearing from people and any questions that you might have. So definitely feel free to reach out at any time. Perfect. I will make sure to link up to all of that in the show notes. Jen, thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to see what the next shape of work it is that that kind of forms up as you're being your authentic self. 
<laughs> yeah, I can't wait either. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. It's been an honor. Well, that's another podcast episode crossed off your listening to-do list. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Jen Lim. I know that I enjoyed talking with her. I hope that you found not only this conversation, but the dive into the book Beyond Happiness beneficial to you. If you did, I would love for you to do me the favor of sharing this episode with somebody you know needs to hear it. Just click on over to the show notes at beyondthetodolist.com or hit the share button in your podcast player app of choice where you're listening to this. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next episode.